whatever you need with those. All right. So then I'll probably take the pictures away once the September starts. So. Everyone getting a reflection from the windows? Maybe you sit on the end no. since you'll be next to me. Oh, next to you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so right here. Wait, is it? Oh, I mean, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right? yeah. So right here. I'm going to put copies of the complaint on the back table. What did you say? Is Jason up there? You guys got the photos? I'm good. You guys good? With the photos? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You want to just keep them there for a little bit or no? no. Okay. Mm -hmm.
can probably see how poor it's going to be. I mean, the bridge went up for it, but it's just, it's like, man, I wish I had one that worked for that. Because it's, mm -hmm. that is just a beautiful night. Yeah, it's, it's like 70 it's degrees. The lights are so grand. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was just cruising real slow yeah. along. You know? We good? So, so I, I just want all of you, um, before you speak, just to say your name and spell it for me and who you're with, just so they have it on. on okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Andy Hale, H-A-L-E. I am the founder of Hale and Monaco, a civil rights law firm based in Chicago. I'm here with one of my partners, Jason Marks, also attorney Mary Sherris, who's with the law firm of Sheriff's Legal, based in Orlando, Florida. And I'm here with Kathy and Lee Mahan, the parents of Kevin Mahan. We're here because yesterday we filed a civil rights and wrongful death lawsuit uh, on behalf of Kevin, who was shot and killed on April 21st, 19, uh, 2022, by Officer Richard, Richard samples the third from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. What we're going to do this morning is Kathy's going to give uh, a brief statement that she has prepared. Mary is going to play the video, the body cam video of uh, officer samples and show it and then kind of break it down. And Jason's going to do, basically describe our legal claims that we filed, what those are and what's in our complaint. We do have copies of the complaint, you know, for you all. And then the attorneys will be happy to answer any questions for you. Before I turn it over to Kathy, I just wanted to say, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, and in fact, our law firm in Chicago primarily defend Chicago police officers. Uh, so I have a lot of police officer friends and I'm a police officer supporter. But when they mess up, they have to be held accountable and they have to be held responsible. And in this situation, it's the most egregious handling of a situation I have personally ever seen. The video you are gonna see should be used as a training video by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, a training video of exactly what not to do. The handling of this case was egregious, egregious. Everything that was done just entirely escalated the situation unnecessarily there was no emergency, none, no emergency. It was a minor little incident that an officer escalated and then took somebody's life. You know, law enforcement has, they can use deadly force, and that is an awesome power. But with it comes an awesome responsibility. And you have to follow your training, and you have to be aware of the situation. What you're going to watch on that video appears like an officer who has had no training at all. It's like you gave a guy a gun day one and you threw him out there responding to this call. That's what it looks like to me. And I've seen a lot of cases. I thought I had seen everything in my 35 years and I hadn't. I've never seen this. So that's why we're here. We filed the lawsuit yesterday. I'm going to let turn it over to Kathy now to um, let her read her remarks that she wrote. We are Kathy and Lee Mahan, and we are the parents of Kevin. On April the 21st, 2022, Kevin needed help. He was experiencing a mental health crisis. Our son was standing alone um, in a wooded area on our family property. We witnessed Officer Samples aggressively rush towards our son with his weapon drawn. We stood in stunned disbelief as we watched with crushing devastation the violent death of our beloved son 
and the impact of this grievous harm has left our hearts of our families inconsolably shattered. It only took 20 seconds from the first moment officer, officer Samples laid eyes on our son to make the irreversible decision to take his life. Uh, we trusted that a mental health crisis would be handled with humanity and with compassion instead of the callous, inhumane violence that we were forced to witness. On April the 21st, 2022, our son needed help and now he's gone. And this is a wound that will never heal because of, because of officers and officer samples impulsive, reckless decision to take the life of our son, our family will never be whole again. And there will always be an ache in our shattered hearts to have him with us. We will never again in this life get to feel of Kevin's kind, gentle, sweet spirit. And some of the unfairness in this life will be made right, and some won't. But we believe that all things will be made right through Christ. Thank you. I'm now going to let Mary share us. Um, we'll let. Uh, we'll excuse. We'll excuse Kathy. Um, before we go through the video. Good morning. I'd like to give you a little context of uh, what happened that morning and where this incident took place. Um, the Mahan family shared uh, an estate amongst their family members here in Jacksonville on a, a nine acre property. And uh, two families basically resided there. Kathy's son, Kevin, resided in one home and his cousin, Kathy's brother's son, resided in another home on the same property. Um, this property was in their family since the 50s. On April 21st, 2022, uh, Kevin Mahan was experiencing um, some mental health issues. He was having a crisis. The police were called regarding a family disturbance, a minor family disturbance. And this family spent the better part of an hour speaking to the police and explaining this to them. What happens next is documented. It is on body cam video and uh, it speaks for itself. I'm gonna play it for you from beginning to end without interruption, and then I'd like to go back and, and make some points.
Okay, so I believe what you saw in this video was uh, Officer Samples rushing aggressively towards Kevin. Um, he immediately draws his weapon. He gets closer to Kevin continuously, and he's yelling at Kevin. What else you see in this video is Kevin is all alone. There's nobody around him. He's stationary. He's not moving. He's not running away. He's not running towards the officer. And he's out in the open. He's in a wooded area in broad daylight. And he's on the family property. He's on his property. And from the moment Officer Samples speaks to Kevin until he fires that shot, 11 seconds go by. So I'm going to play this video again and just uh, walk you through what is taking place. As you can see, he's running. He's running towards uh, a person. This is interesting. He asks, is this him? him, but nobody responds. And the reason no one responds is they don't know at this point. He's drawn his weapon, but he hasn't spoken to anyone. Put your hands down. This is the first time he speaks to Kevin. Um, and as you can see with the, uh, the, the words on the screen, um, Kevin does respond to him, and he's trying to communicate with him. Put the axe down! The officer gets more aggressive. He's yelling. Put the axe down! And he continues to get closer and closer. and he fires his shot. From the moment he says, put the ax down until he fires the shot, 11 seconds go by. What you do not see in this video is the officer approach Kevin in a calm, professional, non-threatening manner. You also do not see the officer identify Kevin. He never asks him who he is. He never says, hi, are you Kevin Mahan? He hasn't confirmed this person's identity yet. The officer does not identify himself. He doesn't say, hello, I'm an officer with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. There's been a complaint made. May I have a word with you? There, there's no uh, identification or statement of his purpose there. He doesn't warn Kevin of the consequences of his commands. And he does nothing to de-escalate the situation. He doesn't speak to Kevin, and he has no interest in Kevin speaking to him. He talks over him on um, both times that Kevin tried to speak to him. The other thing you don't see in the video is you don't see Kevin take a step. He doesn't move from, this, from the position he's in. And you never hear Kevin use threatening language towards the officer. The other thing you don't see is an urgent situation. This officer had all the time in the world to communicate with Kevin, to find out what was going on, and to see, does Kevin even understand what he's saying to him? He's aware at this point that he's having a mental health crisis. You don't see that Kevin is a danger to the public. He is not out in the public. He is on private property, and there are no family members around him at this time. And most of all, what you don't see is any compassion for Kevin's parents, who are with earshot and have a visual of everything that just happened, everything you just saw. And with that, I'm turning it over to Jason.
so I'm going to talk briefly about the lawsuit that we filed. Our complaint that we filed yesterday contains two legal claims. It was filed in federal court here in Jacksonville because our first claim alleges that Officer Samples used excessive force against Kevin. Generally speaking, we all as citizens have the right to be free from excessive force when interacting with the police, and that right is guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now, specifically, as it relates to the use of deadly force, the law provides that an officer may use deadly force if he or she reasonably believes that a suspect's actions place him or others in the immediate vicinity in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. Imminent danger of death or great bodily harm is the key to that, to that uh, law. And as uh, Mary just explained, Kevin did not do anything to place officer samples or anyone else in his immediate vicinity in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. Our second claim is against the city of Jacksonville. It's for wrongful death. We allege that the city of Jacksonville has a duty to refrain from negligent acts against its citizens, like Kevin. And the city of Jacksonville violated that duty in several ways when dealing with Kevin. They violated it by using excessive force against him. They violated it by failing to properly de-escalate the situation. They violated their own training on officer use of force and on mental health. They violated commonly accepted police practices and procedures with regard to officers' use of force and mental health. And they otherwise acted negligently, recklessly, and carelessly when dealing with Kevin. Should this matter go to trial, we are confident we will be able to prove both legal claims and that a jury will award substantial damages in our favor. So at this point, we're happy to answer questions. You know, I probably have a few more things to say, but it, it'll probably come up in the context of answers. So if anybody has a question. One thing that was kind of big when this case happened was that there was no mental health co-responder there on um, behalf of JSO. They mentioned a couple of reasons, number one being that they didn't initially indicate that it was a mental health call from the initial call, and number two, that co-responders are civilians, so they don't place them in harm's way when there are weapons involved. Just want to get your thoughts on the fact that there was no co-responder there. Is that something you're going to bring up in the lawsuit? Who wants to take I, I can address that. Sure. Okay. So uh, I appreciate your question. That's a good point. Within one to two minutes of officer samples arriving on scene, Kathy and her neighbor across the street notified officer samples that he was having a mental health crisis, that he was delusional, that he was believing that people were engaging in mind control with him, and that there was voodoo in his yard. Th these are the things that he was saying to his own family members. And this was communicated clearly to Officer Samples. He heard this. He listened to this. There's body-worn Cambridge footage contained in their conversation. It's long, otherwise we'd play it for you, you here today. At that point, he could have and should have at least called for backup. He could have and should have try to see if there was a mental health professional available to help respond. This is exactly what the program's for. This idea that, well, it didn't initially come out as a mental health call. Well, that might be true, but he immediately learned that it involved mental health. This is exactly what the program's there for, yet he didn't even try to contact anybody. Now, I can see perhaps the person who's uh, the licensed mental health professional might be busy or otherwise occupied, but he didn't even try. He knew Kevin was experiencing a mental health issue, and he didn't bother. He's like, I got it. I, I'm not going to call anybody. I can handle this myself. Handled it very poorly, as you can see. Can I make one other remark on that? What, what's so egregious to me is knowing that, even, even if you didn't know anything about a mental health crisis, I mean, 11 seconds, there was no attempt, none, none, to de-escalate. It's as if... Officer Samples didn't even know what de-escalation was. I mean, not walking up like, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, what, what's, what's your, Kevin, what's up, man? Are you, what's, what's going on? Talk to me, talk to me. You know, like, 
it's not like Kevin had a hostage. Kevin didn't just rob a bank. Kevin just didn't murder 20 people. Kevin's on his own property and has done nothing. And I felt like I was watching a video game, like a sniper. It was like watching a sniper, like, like uh, you know, these video games my son played when he was a kid, you know, Deadly Combat or something. And then the way he calls it in, so just, just so kind of like sniperish, you know, 1033, shots fired. Yeah, I'm good. Like, no duress, just, just matter of fact, like, I'm a Navy SEAL who I just took out, uh, you know, bin Laden. It was, to me, there was such an incredible lack, I mean, none of de-escalation. I mean, Kevin is trying to talk. You can hear it. Listen, bro, even when he raises his hand, I think what he's doing is to say, this is all I got. You know, he doesn't, let's be clear. Jack Civil wants to say, oh, he raised it to here, so I had to shoot him. Does anybody, does anybody throw like this? I played baseball a long time. Do you do, do, you do that? Is, that? is he going to throw an ax at that distance and kill you? Please. I mean, and the thing is, I think what Kevin was doing was raising his arm to be like, this is all I got here. I got this, you know? And Kevin clearly was not in the right frame of mind. If officer samples would have taken the time, and again, what you're taught is time and distance. We had all the time in the world. We had all day. You know, and it, we got all day. We can be here for hours. The goal is we all want to get home safe. The officers and the family. That's always, you know, I've represented hundreds of officers. They want to get home to their families. We all do. And what Samples did was, was just unspeakable. You know, no attempts at all to de-escalate. And talking over Kevin, and, and he will say to you, he was close enough that Kevin could have thrown that hatchet and killed him. Okay? We can test that. We don't think that's true. If Kevin would have thrown it, which he wasn't going to, you could have just been like, move your shoulders. Uh, I doubt a person with a mental health crisis was going to be a champion axe thrower. But putting that aside, here's the most crucial point. If Officer Samples really thought he was close enough to be in danger, why was he that close? If he is, and he, apparently he's got some, he's some champion axe thrower. I don't know if you know this. He's some competitive axe thrower. If he knows the distance in which a human can accurately throw uh, a hatchet, he should not get in that zone. And if you watch that video, you can kind of look at the woodpile. He's getting closer and closer and closer. Why is he getting so close? Why is he getting so close? He could have stayed 100 feet back and just talked. Kevin hasn't moved. Kevin's not chasing him. And I want to read three current JSO policies. We're going to have to find out through discovery what the policies were back during the shooting. I bet they were the same or similar. One is, prior to any use of force, de-escalation techniques should be applied when reasonable. We've already shown there was none. There was nothing samples did to de-escalate, zero. The second is deadly force is only permitted when de-escalation techniques or less lethal force options would not be reasonable. De-escalation was totally reasonable. That's your best. You've got a toolkit. All these officers have a toolkit. You've got a toolbox. De-escalation is step one. I mean, of all the officers I've represented, and again, it's been hundreds, almost every one has never fired their weapon. It's rare. You usually don't have to, and you don't want to. You don't want to. And then the third is officers, this is a key one, officers shall not needlessly place themselves in or remain in situations of great danger and use this as justification for the use of deadly force, which is what Samples did. Samples got so close, unnecessarily, that he claimed, and we disagree with this, that I was so close to Kevin that I was in fear of death or great bodily harm, and he stayed there. He never tried to back up. He never tried to create distance. He never tried to, you know, Kevin, and when he sees, when he's yelling at Kevin to drop the hatchet, it's at his side. It's not even in a threatening manner. And, and I, again, I want to stress, raising it like this wasn't threatening either. Nobody throws anything like that. He hadn't moved. He hadn't taken a step. There's no momentum with his body. There's no aiming, nothing. It was like a sniper taking out, you know, somebody who uh, needed to be, it was like, you know, oh, we got to take this guy out. That's how it looked to me on the video. So it just, if I sound, um, I don't know what the right word is, passionate about it, I am, because it's upsetting. 
it's upsetting. And what's so upsetting is it didn't have to happen. 999 times out of 1,000 with any other officer, Kevin makes it home. Everybody makes it home alive. Officer Samples was the one out of 1,000 because he followed no training, none. This poor family lost their son forever over this, over nothing. Oh, it's, it's just so, it's just so upsetting. So I, I'll let, I'll answer any more questions or I'll let anybody else jump in here. Looks like there were two other officers who were there that maybe responded to after samples. <coughs> are they going to be facing any kind of consequences or are you pursuing any action against them in the lawsuit? Um, we haven't made that decision yet. At this uh, point, we believe we have a basis to sue the city of Jacksonville and its employees. That's why we're including a wrongful death claim. So if we find that another employee of the city of Jacksonville uh, committed excessive force, uh, um, committed a negligent act that caused his death, or otherwise um, is responsible, yes, it's a possibility. But at this point, we just filed a lawsuit. Uh, we have to gather more documents and more information to make that decision. Um, we didn't see in the video there. Was there any attempt to render first aid after the shooting? Did they close in and try to help? I mean, uh, um, yes and no. I would say that um, officers are trained to immediately notify the dispatcher that shots were fired either at the police or by the police. He did that, um, and he did say "roll rescue." I do believe he said that. Um, arguably, he could have um, started trying to render first aid. But apparently he made the immediate decision that Kevin was deceased, and he most likely was, as he was shot in the middle of the forehead. Um, sorry, sorry. Erica, the lawsuit was filed yesterday. What are the next steps moving forward? What are we looking at right now? So, right. so we're going to serve the city of Jacksonville and serve Officer Samples with a complaint. They should receive it uh, very soon. And then typically they hire attorneys and the attorneys engage in litigation with us. Um, you know, the state of Florida has a procedure by which we notify the city of Jacksonville of potential claims, and we did that as we do and are required to do for all lawsuits in Florida, uh, but their risk management division of the city of Jacksonville responded that uh, they're not interested in uh, resolving this without litigation, basically saying, um, we didn't do anything wrong, go ahead and file your lawsuit, so we sit here today. Let me take the JLS part and then the JSO part, and you can do the. I'll leave them right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's say we're playing like yeah. So let me talk about the, the JSO part. Uh, am I surprised that uh, the agency investigating one of its own found it was a justified shooting? No. Uh, that's what you typically see. Uh, I don't think that's the way, and that's the way it's commonly done, fortunately, you know, in most jurisdictions. Um, and I don't think it's a fair, unbiased procedure when you set it up that way. There's just an inherent conflict of interest when you've got JSO, uh, you know, investigating one of their own. You know, I, I've seen this many times. And again, I'm usually on the other side of it. Um, uh, you know, they circle the wagons. So uh, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, that's the common response, no matter what you see, no matter what the facts are. It's unfortunate, um, but that's the reality. Jason can address the state's attorney's investigation, which was different. With regard to the state's attorney's office, um, it's rare, as you all know, when they bring charges against an officer. Um, that's primarily because it's a very high standard the state's attorney has to prove. They have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Officer Samples was unjustified in shooting Kevin. Now, that's a very high standard, as well as it should be, because you're trying to take away somebody's freedom in a criminal court. It's different in civil court. In civil court, the plaintiff, that is Kathy and us, have the burden of proof. And the burden of proof is a preponderance of the evidence. Is it more likely than not that officer samples use excessive force? Yes. Is it more likely than not that an agent of the city of Jacksonville negligently caused uh, Kevin's death? The answer is yes. So it's a different burden of proof, and it's not really a surprising result uh, considering uh, that, that factor. Yeah, you guys mentioned Maka. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. 
No, go ahead. I was gonna, you guys mentioned monetary compensation. Is there any other things you're looking for policy-wise or maybe a change in the way these things are reviewed? Well, I think, you know, what we want, what we would love is Kevin to come back. You know, um, we can't bring him back. Um, that That's what ultimately you wish. And uh, not a day goes by where not everybody sitting up here wishes we could do that. But so in a civil suit, um, all you can recover is monetary damages. Um, that'll be up to a jury. You know, a jury will decide what those damages are. Uh, we think it should be substantial because, you know, somebody lost their life, somebody lost a son. But I think the other important concepts, and I think by filing the suit, you want accountability and you want responsibility. There's not going to be change until somebody is held responsible and accountable for what they did. You know, I mean, I think this, this is a wake-up call to JSO. We have to do a better job. If we've got an officer out there like Officer Samples acting in this way, clearly as if he has not had any training whatsoever. It's like you picked the guy up in the lobby of this hotel today, and you gave him a gun, and you threw him out in that situation. I bet he could have done a better job than Samples did. I don't think anybody would have done what Samples did. Nobody. So I think you want accountability and you want responsibility. And from that, you're hoping to bring change. You're hoping that JSO gets better, officers get better trained, they get more aware. And I think it's a teaching moment. There was a heavy price to pay for that teaching moment. But we're really hoping that uh, JSO takes a hard look at themselves and there's some accountability and then there's responsibility in this case, broadly and in this case. JSO's review board said that uh the officer involved knew about criminal prior criminal history with the sus or the victim prior to the shooting. Do you think that contributed to the way he reacted and, and why? Mary, you want to take that one? Are these close enough for her? Okay. Well, it's it's hard to tell what was in the mind of the officer, but we don't feel that any prior criminal activity what warranted the way the officer treated um, Kevin at that time. Um, Kevin has been working. He had been working since he was 19 years old in the electrical field. Um, right up until I think the year before this incident happened, um, he was a productive member of society. Um, his prior offenses were nonviolent. Um, so I, I don't see how that could have factored in. But I think more importantly, what was before the officer at the time should have factored in the most because what he was presented with didn't warrant what took place. In other words, this was a family crisis. This was a family disturbance. No one was being threatened. There was no like Andy said earlier, there was not like a hostage situation where this person needed to be taken out. What he was presented with was a nonviolent situation, and he took it to the next level, and he could have handled it completely differently. Uh, I don't know, Jason, if you have you anything to, to add to that. you want to talk about the, you know, the the criminal history part, how long that go that was, that, you know, the one. Sure. So um, I, I do recall that the. Um, the now sheriff spoke about this incident shortly after it happened and, and described Kevin as a, a violent criminal or words to that effect. And that's simply not true. Now, um, perhaps the worst thing on Kevin's record, so to speak, happened when he was 19 or 20 years old. He committed a robbery. And so he was a convicted felon at that point. That's true. But the sheriff spoke as if Kevin has a long history of violence, as in every other year he's getting arrested for armed robbery, resisting officers with violence, assault and battery, aggravated battery, but that's simply not true. If you look at his criminal history, which is available on the Duval County uh, public website, it's available to everyone, it shows a litany of traffic violations in very few serious offenses, and the ones that are, are not anywhere near this time frame. Nothing within the last nine or ten years of his life. And nothing violent. Kevin was not a violent person. This is just an attempt to bootstrap a justification, oh, we're dealing with a violent person. He wasn't violent. And that just shows you, you know, they're already, again, circling the wagons and trying to blame this on the criminal history. Uh, he wasn't violent, and that had, should have had no bearing on the situation.
And Samples was there, like we said, for how long? Almost an hour? Yep. Almost an hour with the family on Kevin's property. I mean, I can't even stress that enough. With the family on Kevin's property. There's not even an attempt. And even if you argue a mental health professional couldn't have come over because Kevin had allegedly a weapon, let's just play that out. The family's there. JSO could have said, what do you think? You think it might help like, for you to talk to him? You know, is that like, at least consult the family, right? What do you think? Is it going to agitate him or could it maybe help for you to go over and just try to talk to Kevin and just calm him down as the parents, you know? Not even an attempt to do that. You know, Samples acted like I've got this, again, you know, urgent situation of a guy in the woods and in, in 11 seconds or whatever it was, it's done. So I think they could have, you got to, all the time in the world. Family's here. Take your time. Let's get a plan. Let's get a plan. Samples took matters into his own hands. Samples had an hour with the family before the shooting? Okay. Yes. He was on the property there. So he's getting all the background on Kevin, what's going on. You know, he was there. There was no urgency. He had already talked to the family at length. He'd been filled in on everything. You know, and then when you see what, like Mary said, when he said, is that him? He doesn't even wait for an answer. And he runs. Let's pause. Kevin hasn't done anything. Kevin's on his property. Okay, walk over and talk to him. He runs, and then in 11 seconds, you could not have, you could not have, again, like I said, it's a training video for exactly how not to do it. Run so close that you think you're in danger. Talking to a guy who doesn't understand you because he's having a mental health crisis. He's trying to talk to you, but you're not listening. And you know what? You say to yourself, my only option, you know what? The only thing I can do is put a bullet in his forehead. I think that's all I got. That's my only option right now. It is egregious. I'd like to add something. Go for it. We don't have this video um, here with us, but by the grace of God, this entire incident is on video. It's, everyone had body cam. Um, shortly after this video ends, um, there is body cam footage, and an officer runs up to Officer Samples and says, what happened? What did he do? And his response is, he wouldn't put it down. Not, he was about to kill me with an ax. He wouldn't put it down. Is Officer Samples still working? Could be a question for JSO. I just wanted to see if you guys knew that. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, he is. Um, it's our understanding that he was only an officer for two years at the time of this incident, so now he's been an officer for about four years, and to the best of our knowledge, he's currently on the force. And just a couple of details here. I know this happened a couple of years ago. Maybe we have some of these already, maybe we don't. But uh, the initial call was about Kevin cutting power lines to neighbors. It sounds like the property was pretty big. Did he ever cut power lines to or power to anybody else besides just the immediate family or on the property. Mary, you want to address that? Sure. Because it was actually all family, but explain yeah. that. Yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't neighbors, it was his cousin's house. So um, apparently during this time he's having the, the mental breakdown or crisis, he's, um, it's at 4 a.m. and he's cut some wires at, the, uh, at his cousin John's house. And the police are called because John doesn't know who's outside, he can hear somebody. And the police come out and they have a conversation with Kevin and decide that it is not an arrestable offense, and they don't arrest them. They just tell them to go home. So uh, the second time they come out is around 11, and that's because the neighbor called, um, because Kathy Mahan had told the neighbor, if you see Kevin come back to the house, um, I think he's having some problems. Could you please call me right away? So the neighbor calls Kathy, but also calls 911, and says, oh, Mrs. Mahan said, you know, I should call uh, if I see Kevin and I saw him and he's behaving erratically. So that's why Samples comes to the house, meets with the family. He's there for the better part of an hour talking to the Mayhans and then Cousin John and his family about what's happened. And then that's when Kevin returns to the property and that video picks up. And, and just so to be clear there, the police spoke to Kevin at that 4 a.m. incident, he cut the cables. Nothing, it was a minor thing. He's not even arrested. It was like, okay, kind of like a no harm, no foul, and it was done. And all that's happened now at 11 is, Kevin's back on the property. That's it. Kevin's back. 
Kevin's back. If you watched, if you showed that video and said, okay, I'm gonna show you this officer charging at somebody and yelling like this. I want, to, I want you to guess what you think this person did. You'd probably get like answers like, oh, he just like slaughtered a family, he just killed some people, he just took a hostage. If you said, no, he did nothing, he's on his own property. And by the way, had Officer Samples bothered to ask and find out about Kevin's history, they would have learned that Kevin occasionally chopped wood in the back of his property when he was going through some sort of mental health issue. Had Officer Samples even asked that, he would have found that out, but he wasn't interested in finding out things. He's more interested in apparently uh, looking up Kevin's criminal history. That's important to him, but finding out what's going on with Kevin and trying to peacefully resolve the situation, no, that's not important. That's not important to him. Kevin never was seen with a hatchet until the very end, so it wasn't like he had a hatchet at 4 a.m. Nobody saw him with a hatchet when he showed up on the property. Uh, and according to you know his parents, uh, he liked to chop wood when he was going through things, and he probably was doing that. Came across the hatchet in the woods, and then it led to what you saw. Based on the video, I'm guessing that you believe JFO needs to change their policy and review their policy. What kind of changes would you like to see made? So I think I think you have to really. It's one thing to hand out materials and to and uh, and you know, and people all got the materials, but. De-escalation, you have to have a real conversation with people. If I was in the room with 20 officers right now, I'd say, let's talk about it. What are some de-escalation techniques, ladies and gentlemen? Let's talk about it. Oh, talking to people. That's one. We can talk. We can create time. Is there time available? Let's, let's, let's lengthen our time here. Let's, let's bring it, let's, let's just bring it down a level. How can we do that? Let's lower our voice. Oh, we got a mental health person? I mean, I think there needs to be more like a group discussion. I don't know how they do their training. But clearly, Officer Samples didn't understand, A, the need to de-escalate. And I don't think he understood what de-escalation is. I really think you know they need to have kind of a round table where everybody talks, and they have scenarios. How would you handle this situation? You know, this shouldn't be uh, a one-off. This should be something where when people show up, they say, you know what? I remember this. This was like our training when we had the person with the mental health issue. Let's, let's break out some of our de-escalation techniques. Or here's the other thing. Officer Samples could have easily talked to other people at the scene or called it in and say, hey, got this guy who showed up on the property. Um, apparently he's having a mental health crisis. Let's get a game plan, right? So I think there has to be a much, much, much more open conversation and uh, something to ensure that the officers really understand what de-escalation techniques are and how they can be implemented. And just one more thing on that. We wish that the sheriff's office, the command staff, would have an honest conversation with each other. Uh, publicly or privately, it matters not, but they need to have a conversation with each other and look at each other and say, is this really what we train our officers to do? Is this really acceptable conduct? The answer to that is no. The answer to that is no. So even if they don't change any of their policy, they need to enforce their policy. They need to hold people accountable when they violate their policy, and they clearly have. Mr. Hale told you how they violated it, and it needs to start here, and it's start now. Um, the parents are the closest to this situation. Can we get an idea of just how far away they were? You mentioned they were watching through a window. So my understanding is, um, they could see Officer Samples and everything he was doing that entire time. They couldn't see Kevin. Is, is they, they were not. No, they're outside. They're, they're, they're literally outside right around the corner. I mean, just right around how many feet would you say? I would estimate about 65, 70 feet. So they're outside just around the corner, but they can see what Samples is doing. They can't see Kevin in the woods, but they're out there. So they're available. They're right there. <clears throat> That's already been discussed, so if I ask this question and you already answered, just let me know. No problem. I know Marilyn Parker was channel four. Uh, you were mentioning policy. Obviously, state attorney, the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, they've already said that they feel the shooting was justified. They've made their ruling. They stand by what this officer did in that moment. How is this filing going to make that any different? Well, uh, they're wrong. So what this, what, uh, we don't agree with them. Uh, what you missed was JSO investigated one of their own. 
this is common, uh, and I've seen this many, many times. An agency kind of circles the wagons, and they come up with justifications why. The state's attorney is different. That's a criminal matter. It's a higher burden, as, as Jason explained. Uh, and they elected not to bring charges. But here in a civil suit, it's preponderance of the evidence. It's more likely true than not. Uh, and it's a jury of your peers. It's a jury of, of Kevin and his family's peers. They will decide whether excessive force was used. You know, uh, uh, 12 people in the community. So what JSO did is not binding. What the state's attorney's office did is not binding. They can make all the kind of, you know, uh, findings they want. The great thing about our legal system is ordinary citizens are, have the ability to bring a civil lawsuit and seek justice. And a jury of your peers will decide. And the jury may agree with us, the jury may not agree with us. But uh, we get the opportunity to present our case. And that's what we're looking forward to doing. Can you talk about, you know, in your history, what you've seen as far as police relations and the way they deal with those who have mental illnesses? We had actually just had a situation on Saturday where there was a person in San Marco and they were having a mental health episode or illness. And the officer, one of them tased that person and the other person, the other officer shot them three times in the leg. They're still alive. Yeah. Well, there are, I, I think, to answer the first part of your question, I think, and I, I've dealt with a lot of police departments, you know, especially Chicago, but a lot of other ones, I think mental health is, is still incredibly um, overlooked. I don't think it gets the attention and emphasis it deserves. Uh, I think we're learning as a society a lot more people have mental health issues than we realize. It's not a stigma. It's, it's something that a lot of people deal with, which we understand. But I don't think police departments have caught up. I think they're still very old-fashioned, and they're, they're, like a, they're like a decade behind the research and the science. And I don't think they've given in their budgets the time, attention, money, and resources they need to address mental health, especially from a training perspective. And in the situation you said, you know, one of the options is, in a mental health situation, less than lethal force. You know, do we have to really kill this person? You know, is that our only option? Is there a way we can do something else? Officers are trained in, you know, when, when there's a threat to use deadly force. But to your point, um, I think that's something where departments have to find, they have to spend more time discussing it, figuring it out, and, and addressing how can we deal with mental health issues. Because it's common. It's going to get, it's going to keep coming up. And it was mentioned in the family's statement about well, in this situation. And so the other side of this, having to ask, is were there calls made previously? Were there attempts to help in this person's mental illness before the situation even unfolded? Yeah, the family tried to Baker Act him, and they were told a, a couple of times, actually, and they were told that he didn't qualify. So they, they did try to intervene and help him. Um, and on this day, they thought, well, you know, if the police arrest him, maybe that's an intervention, and that can help us get him help. Um, they never, you know, thought it would spiral into this direction. You know, it, it was it was just an intervention. That's all it was. It, and let me just say that a lot of officers get what's called CIT training, crisis intervention training, and it's typically a forty-hour course in which they teach officers uh, to learn about the signs and symptoms of somebody experiencing a mental health crisis and how to respond to that. And it's likely, we don't know yet, it's likely officer samples receive that. It's been an emphasis of police training for at least the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, but go, no, go ahead. But apparently, that's not enough. Apparently, they're not paying attention in class. I mean, they might be listening a little bit, but we don't see, we, unfortunately, a lot of police-involved shootings involve somebody experiencing a mental health issue. And yet, and yet they apparently aren't finding uh, safe, ways to resolve these, these uh, uh, issues. The distinction I want to make that's really important here is the difficult situation is one where you don't know if it's a mental health situation. You're called to a house at 422 Green Street and there's a person barricaded. You don't know if that person inside is having a mental health crisis. They might. And it's a tough situation when you have to be a mental health counselor on the scene. That's not what we had. We had officer samples on the property for an hour with the family telling him about they thought it was a mental health issue, explaining to him Kevin's history. Uh, samples had an hour to ask questions, 
tell me more. You know, I mean, so it was a situation where Officer Samples knew it was an unusual situation. He knew there were mental health issues. So this was the easy one, and he still did what he did. You established that Kevin wasn't threatening violence on anyone in the moment of the shooting. Had there been, over the course of this whole morning, any threat of violence toward anyone besides no, the No, no. And in fact, if you look at, I think it's in one of the JSO, you know, when, when they justified the shooting, I think one of the things they tried to say was, you know, and Samples is also trying to protect other people, okay? When you start seeing things like that, that that's when you know, like, when, when, you're, when they're getting that desperate. You can see in the video, there's nobody else around. He's not even moving. So there is no argument that, oh, not only was, was I in danger, but there were other people in danger? Who? There's, it's, he's on his own property. There's nobody even around. But no, he had not done anything to anybody that morning. None. And I want to add, too, there was no warrant for his arrest. You know, so this was purely an investigation. In fact, you, you would see on uh, some previous body cam uh, video that Samples said, hey, there's nothing we can do, you know, if, if you have a problem with your relative, get an injunction. So th his mindset was not even that this person was arrestable at the time. And that's all documented, not, not my opinion. Um, and I, I just think the most important thing that, that stands out to me in all of this is he gave this man 10 seconds to process what was happening. Because although Samples knew what was happening, this man didn't. He was in the woods chopping a branch. He didn't know what is happening. All of a sudden, there's somebody pointing a gun at him, ordering him to drop his ax. So 10 seconds is a short time. It's a long time, but it's a short time when you don't know what's happening. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.